Hello and welcome to another episode of Out of Spec Reviews. You join me with the 2022 Winnebago Revel. This is our new Revel. We just bought it and we bought it to create a van life series here on this channel, taking you through the buying and ownership experience of one of these Winnebago Revels. Now, if you're a longtime viewer of this channel and others, you know that we review plenty of new cars, but we only get them for a week at a time and it's so hard to provide a long-term update. Here, at least with this, we're gonna take you from the purchasing all the way through at least a year plus of ownership and see what it's like to join the Van Life family. Now in this video, it's gonna be quite a long one. We're gonna have it broken up into chapters. So if you're interested in a particular portion, for example, some of the issues we might be having with this van with just two weeks into ownership and 2000 miles on it, you can just skip right over there. But if you wanna watch the whole thing, grab a big can of popcorn, can of popcorn, bucket of popcorn, and I'm gonna run you through basically everything we've experienced with this Winnebago Revel from start until now, about 14 days of ownership. Before we get into our experience with this Revel, let's talk about what it is. Well, there's plenty of different RVs, recreational vehicles on the market from a class A bus to a class C sort of box on a chassis. This particular style is called the class B and it's basically a van build. So you can get a Ford Transit, a Dodge or a Ram Promaster or a Mercedes Sprinter are the three popular conversion van builds. I've seen them also on E-Class Ford chassis or uh, even some GM uh, other chassis, but all together pretty much you're going to get Sprinter, Transit, or Ram. And so you kind of have to choose, I think, first is what kind of vehicle do you want to be driving around? Uh, the Promasters are generally front wheel drive, which just nixed it off the list for me. I'm not a fan of that. I know it's not a performance car, but that just didn't do it for me, plus not a fan of the styling. Uh, the transits are really cool, and if you get a top spec one, you can actually get Copilot 360, so we'll do really good driver assistance. That was high up on the list, and you can get the EcoBoost engine, which just rips, and those are pretty neat, and there's uh, a new version of that called uh, from Winnebago called the Winnebago Echo, which I'm very much looking forward to testing. We'll bring that to you here on this channel, and that's a four-wheel drive, overlanding type uh, transit build, but it's more of a B plus. It's kind of got a cab on the back of it. It's kind of interesting. And the reason we went here with the Revel on the Sprinter chassis was two, you know, a couple different reasons. I'm a Mercedes guy. Um, I think they look the best. I think it's the most premium. Uh, I love MBUX, the infotainment. And I like that it was a diesel too. You know, we're going to be pulling heavy loads, running this thing wide open throttle with big trailers on the back. I just wanted something that was dependable and that Mercedes V6 diesels, from what I hear, just run and run. Now, not to say they're not without their intricacies, we'll get into it in a little bit, but that's the reason I chose the Sprinter chassis. And then once you start looking at van builds on the Sprinter chassis, you have the Storyteller Overland, you have the One Trans West builds down in Frederick, can't remember the name off the top of my head, maybe the Everest, I don't know. There's a few different uh, you know, vans you can choose from. And we ultimately, of course, obviously, settled on the Revel by Winnebago. The first, right off the bat, the reason I was just like, oh, well, we got to get one. It's a very silly reason, but I'm a silly person, is come over here and take a look at this. LED headlights. It's so rare to find sprinters with factory LED headlights. I just think they look great at night. They look great during the day. Really nice running lights, better tail lights. And so the Storyteller Overland and the other ones all had the base halogen lights. And I'm like, well, if you're spending, you know, this thing stickers out just under $200,000. If you're going to spend that kind of money on a vehicle, well, you better have the best headlights possible from a styling perspective and from a light output. And the Revel was that. But then I was able to back up my decision. I didn't let that sway my whole buying decision. But I backed up that decision with just the search results on Google, what people are looking for, what they're interested in, what the owner group base is like, what the aftermarket support is like, what the factory support is like from a dealer service network. And Winnebago just has the most searched for class BRV and it's this Revel right here. So from a business perspective, you know, us providing content on a vehicle, this will be more relevant to more people. We'll also have something we can compare all of the other models too that's a known quantity it's sort of like a tesla model 3 that's why we bought one everyone knows what it is it's a known quantity and the comparison videos always do well so 
you know, not to beat around the bush, it was a, bus a business decision to get the Revel over other vans, but I'm not, you know, disappointed with it, very much enjoy it. So that's why we bought the Revel. Let's go around the back and I'll tell you how we bought the Revel. So once I settled in on the exact unit that I wanted to purchase, again, for the company so we can provide videos to you, uh, it started the nationwide search of getting the best price. Now, a lot of people will argue, you know, direct sales manufacturer, dealers are outdated. I actually totally disagree. I think dealers have a good place and I really like negotiating on a price. I like to send out bids, you know, basically contacted every single dealer in the country who sells Revels and I said, look, we are planning on buying a Revel for media coverage. We want to enjoy it as a personal use vehicle with our dogs, but also to provide videos on. Happy to plug the dealership we bought it from, but what's your best price? And we went back and forth. Turns out that I got a best price at a place that I also have friends working at. Funny how that works sometimes. And it was from General RV and they, honestly not sure where they're located. I think they have a whole network of dealerships. Anyway, never went to one, never had to step foot in a store. This is why I think the whole idea of buying an RV local to you makes almost no sense whatsoever. Um, I think the only benefit of buying one local to you is your service might get you in sooner, but I've heard so many mixed results, I would say it kind of doesn't matter. In our case, we got a great deal at General RV. I want to say thank you very much to Alex D'Angelo, who I believe sells more Revels than at least most in the country, and uh, he really hooked us up and made it possible. Now, when you go and buy a Winnebago Revel, you pretty much have to go to the dealer you bought it from and pick it up, and what happens is someone from the Winnebago factory in Forest City, Iowa, or in the case of this, they're made in... Uh, man, can't remember the name of it, but the, like 12 miles north of Forest City. We, uh, you know, they drive the van to the dealership and then you end up taking delivery of your new vehicle with like 1,200 miles on it, or if it's really far, 2,000 miles on it. And in some cases they have to tow a car to drive back. So you get a brand new RV, in this case a Revel, that's just run wide open throttle on the highways with a tow vehicle. And well, that doesn't seem that good, does it for engine break-in? So I asked Alex and Winnebago PR, and I said, hey, you know, we're gonna be making this into a series, into videos, can we pick it up at the factory in Iowa? And they said, you know, normally we don't offer this, but because you guys are YouTubers and we wanna do it for the video, again, full transparency, they said, yes, we'll just park it in the parking lot, you guys can come pick it up at the factory. And that brings us to our next topic. What was factory delivery like? So what was our factory delivery like? Well, uh, we were able to take delivery at the factory, again, thanks to Winnebago because we make YouTube videos. And this is all filmed on our out of spec motoring channel. So a sister channel to this particular one. And you know, no need to beat around the bush. It was an awkward, weird experience. You know, we're buying, again, an MSRP of just about $200,000 vehicle. And you'd expect something a little bit special when you do that. But we flew into Minneapolis, not to say, like I'm okay that they didn't do anything special, but like also kind of funny that they didn't. Uh, so we flew into Minneapolis and uh, there were, you know, there's no way to get down to Forest City, Iowa. That's easy. So it's a two and a half hour drive. So we thought, oh, let's rent a car. Well, they were all out of rental cars. So we ended up taking an Uber from Minneapolis airport down to Forest City, Iowa. Just turned out, you know, to be like the worst Uber driver ever. He was in his Odyssey going full throttle, lifting off, full throttle, lifting off. How that car had 180,000 miles on it and did not have an exploded transmission, I have no idea, but that's a testament to Honda build quality. But Alyssa and I were just about thrown up in the back seat of that car. She was texting me. She's like, uh, can we find another way? I'm like, we're in the middle of nowhere. This is our only option. So we uh, took that Uber down to Forest City, Iowa. They had a um, sort of a customer service center. And so we show up and we walk inside and you know this is our factory delivery and they're like hey how can we help you and i said oh we're kind of listen over here to pick up our revel oh great awesome well it turned out everyone was there for service so we got our first glimpse into what rv ownership might be like because every single other person was there because they had a major defect with their rv that required them having to go back to the factory to have it fixed and i guess you know good way to be exposed to what to expect right off the bat and that, you know, totally aware of what he, what's uh, going on here. My friend Steve Leto says, never to buy a new RV or used RV unless you know exactly what you're getting into. And with all the research I've done, I knew what we were getting into. 
And, and it was so funny. It took them, I would say, probably an hour of waiting around to figure out, oh, you guys are actually here to pick up a new one. Then they found a guy and then they went to go find our RV and then brought it around to us, which was nice. And they were like, oh, here are the keys. We're like, great. Your appointment's tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Like, wow, that's early <laughs> because, again, we were an hour behind. So that's 7 a.m. is really 6 a.m. for us or maybe it was 5 a.m. I can't remember. Uh, so we're like, no worries. We'll grab the RV. Can we at least stay in it for the night and figure it out? And they said, oh, yeah, no problem. So they just handed us the keys and we just went on our way. Um, and that was kind of weird. <laughs> so we, we figured it out the first night, had a blast. You can see all this on out of spec motoring. This was just across the street at sort of their visitor center. And uh, yeah, that was it. Went, went back the next morning for orientation. Every question I asked, the, the guy was super nice, but they typically handle with the big buses, the class A motorhomes. And uh, he just had really no idea about this thing, to be honest. I was like, oh, so how does this thing work? And he's like, oh, I don't know. And so anyway, we just kind of figured it out on our own. If you thought we got like a full delivery at the factory, you thought wrong. Uh, we, we really had to figure things out, but that's okay. I'd watched every video on the Rebel, so many great ones out there. And I do want to mention as well, General RV was just super awesome throughout the whole thing. If I had any questions, I could just message them directly. And, um, you know, it's a very non-traditional way to take delivery. I do not expect you to go through the same thing. There are many people who want to take delivery close to the factory. There is a dealer a mile away from Winnebago. Um, and I called them seeing if we could just buy one from them. But it was like $30,000 more expensive and was it like a year waiting list. So we ended up doing it our way and it worked out, I would say, even better. So that was our factory delivery. Before we go any longer into this video, I want to take you on a quick tour of the interior and exterior of our Rebel, how we spec'd it, why we spec'd it this way, and maybe some intricacies and oddities that you may not know. At some point in the future, I'll do like a full in-depth tour of this thing, but this will just be a quick highlight. So. We have a 2022 Winnebago Rebel. That is like the official registering name of the vehicle, but it's built on a 2020 Mercedes-Benz Sprinter 2500 4x4 chassis. And it's built in Germany, the chassis, and then shipped over here. Now there is a South Carolina production plant for Sprinters, but the 4x4s, at least at this point, are all built in Germany. And the reason that this is brand new, but it's a 2020 chassis, is Mercedes hasn't started importing the 2021s yet, or even selling them. And we are expecting either them just to skip the 2021 model year, or for them to have a life cycle impulse, or a sort of a refresh halfway through the 2021 year that will be uh, sort of a, a styling upgrade, mechanical upgrade, and just sort of little tweaks, but I believe they will be getting rid of the six cylinder. At least that's the rumor. We'll talk more about this engine and how it drives towards the end of this video. So that is why it's a 2020 Sprinter with a 2022 conversion, but we picked it up, I think with 56 miles on it is when we took delivery. So brand new to us, which is pretty cool. Come around this way. So. We have a giant windshield that was cracked five miles into us taking delivery. Safe Flight came over, repaired it. We have since tinted it and we'll get into some upgrades and modifications we've already done and want to do in the near future. Uh, you have these uh, BF Goodrich KO2 tires on Method Racing wheels. I'm not sure I'm a huge fan of this combo. I think if I was to do it again, I would spec the base wheels, just the steelies from the factory, and then upgrade my own aftermarket. The BF Goodrichs are awesome. The KO2 is great legendary tire for sort of dirt and mud and general overlanding, but extremely noisy on the highway and uh you know just a lot of tire cavity noise from about 35 to 55 miles an hour then you have the method racing wheels which i think are okay but not particularly attractive or aggressive and i think again you can be a little bit more creative on your own perhaps in the future you'll see us even upgrade these at some point um no so the, the what's funny is mercedes advertises this as having like keyless entry. Well, guess what? You don't. So there's no like open and lock button from the handle. You have to go into your pocket, hit unlock or lock every time, and uh, then you can start the vehicle. You do not need to put the key in its little key slot. As long as the key is in the cabin, it will just start right up. So that's easy. 
We have, uh, obviously, coming around the outside, some exterior lighting, these awesome little nets from Rolf, and they have this magnetic counterpart, so you don't actually need to zip and unzip every time you get inside. This has worked really well so far, except come in and take a look at this. I'm not sure if this is a defect, but I asked the guys at the factory, and they're like, it'll get better over time, but here we are after using this for weeks. You can see it doesn't quite add up here, and I think, uh, yeah, you, sometimes we just kind of have to mesh this manually, move it around so that we get a tight seal. Again, just one of those things that you're constantly doing that just gets a little bit annoying over time, but it's a very small problem. We have this awesome carefree awning that doesn't require any posts, and uh, there's an app for it to work. The, I haven't been able to figure out how to get my phone connect. Apparently, you're supposed to hold in this switch for three seconds after bringing it out, there's a whole process. I haven't been able to figure it out, and I'm pretty good with tech, um, but that, that's something I haven't spent too much time on. It's got a light. It comes all the way out really easy. We've used it a couple times out camping. It's been awesome. I think I've slept in this thing close to 10 nights so far, and it's been uh, really a cool experience. So you can see these awesome LEDs that come around here that light up just enough at night. Uh, the other night, we were camped right by a river, super surreal. I was making dinner right here on the table. Man, it was just sort of the dream come true, everything I've been looking forward to doing. So, you know, super pumped that we have this thing, really awesome. This color is one of three colors that the Revel comes in. It's a blue-gray, sort of like this here. You can get silver or you can get tan. We were between this or the tan. I think, oh, what am I trying to say? I think we made the right choice going here with the blue, just for looking good on camera and thumbnails and I don't know, I think it's a good color. We almost didn't get it though because they ran out of orders for blue ones and then someone canceled so we got ours sooner. I think our total time from order to delivery was about eight weeks. Come around the back with me. So let's close this, we'll go inside here in a second. You can see that the van has lettering, four by four, branding for the Revel. I actually really like this thing but I think we'll take these four by four things off. I think we'll take that Winnebago one off over there. And actually, let me just mention these running boards really quick. They seem to be pretty sturdy, which is awesome. So really liking that. We've used this feature here on both sides, tying up the dogs to these little tie outs here. That's worked wonderfully. Um, and, and there's also under lighting. So you can see the side markers are on here and it also lights up underneath the van. However, these rails are not without problems right off the bat. First off, I'm not sure if they're too low, but I think we might end up reaching the limitation here off-roading, sort of going over some things. We haven't yet, but we haven't taken it on any aggressive trails. Here in Colorado, we've done the Switzerland Trail, some national forest stuff, enough to get a wheel in the air here or there, but we haven't taken it out to like Moab or anything. But this is my main concern. Come on in, and this isn't just on this particular one. You can see they put this black finish on everything, and it's already starting to peel in places where I'm not sure how that's totally possible. So I do worry about future rust uh, on here on this thing. I've heard of others just like completely falling off due to rust. So that's a concern. Um, I sort of get the impression, my impression here is Winnebago is like a good general builder, but I wouldn't say everything here is bespoke, top quality. We're not there at all. And I think that might be something we should look forward to or look into when we start comparing this Revel to others such as Storyteller and just try and gauge the quality of materials. One of my biggest issues with this entire van is this exhaust pipe right here. And the exhaust system in general being a diesel is quite annoying. We'll talk about it when we drive it, but uh, particularly this exhaust pipe is to me the most like terrible error they could have made. Look at this bra mounting bracket. I show this to people and they're like, how is that possible? And I guess they took the stock exhaust off to try and route the exhaust out here. So if you're laying in the back, you don't suffocate yourself with fumes or something. But at the end of the day, this is the lowest point of the van. It's gonna get totally knocked off when we start doing some crawling, you know, approaching obstacles here. So that has to go. We need an aftermarket solution. If you know of one, comment it, or maybe we can just put a stock exhaust on that we find from someone. Now, the Sprinter itself, the Revel, is built on a 144 inch uh, Sprinter chassis, and it's the tall, the high roof. So four wheel drive with a factory lift kit in the shortest wheelbase means it's the most maneuverable off-road. We have the most ground clearance you can get from the factory. We have the shortest wheelbase, so it actually fits in a normal parking spot. And it's really no harder to drive than like your normal everyday car. So I'm very pleased with the size, with the chassis, no complaints there at all. 
Coming around the back here, I think it's funny, someone points it out that these look like frowny faces, and uh, I think that's kind of hilarious all around. So, uh, more badging in the back here. You can see we put the out-of-spec motoring uh, logo there. Perhaps we'll keep it, perhaps we won't. We have this ladder on the back that I'm not a fan of, uh, because you can't climb on it here on the back. I've seen people do it, but it's very much recommended that you don't, because it puts all the stress on this mounting point. Uh, what you do is you just untwist this little thing, hook it into the roof rails on the side, and then you can climb straight up. It's actually pretty simple and easy. Uh, I think I'd like to get a side-mounted ladder solution and then put boxes on the back. So we'll see. This van also is rated at towing 5,000 pounds from the factory, which we have not tried yet, but we will. Perhaps we'll do a whole video on an MPG loop with and without a trailer, perhaps. I don't know. You guys let us know what you want to see, but uh, curious about how that will work. Coming around the sides, we have some interesting things over here as well. You'll notice both sides of the van have these flares. They are aftermarket, but they come from the factory from Winnebago. They're sort of part of the upfit, I should say. And it means that you can lay completely sideways in the bed. So I'm six foot one, I can lay totally flat. And that's purely because we get these extra few inches on either side, wouldn't have it any other way. This window is lovely at night, you get a nice breeze. Uh, really fantastic solution, I think. Continuing along, we have our 30 amp, 125 volt power connection here. We'll talk about the whole electrical system in uh, a future chapter of this video, but I do want to you guys to make note, this is where you hook it up to power. Yes, it will let you drive away when it's hooked up. There's no power circuit uh, interrupter or anything like that. So just be mindful. And this is our cassette tank right here. So the toilet is just inside the van. You can do your business in there. It goes into this tank. I keep gloves in here. I've emptied it once so far. It's been a non-issue. We pulled it out, dumped it in the toilet in our house, and then put it back in the van. It's been great. Been using the restroom quite a bit in here. Holds about five gallons, which in human waste form, that is honestly quite a few days for us at least. So that is your quick exterior tour of the 2022 Winnebago Rebel. Again, I can go in depth and I could spend an hour just talking about the hood, what's underneath all of this stuff. If you're interested in a super long detailed overview of this van and maybe even other RVs and vans, we will bring that to you right here on this channel. Jumping inside the van, there's a few things I'd like to show you. Now, again, this isn't gonna be our full tour, but I do want you to get an idea of sizing. And one thing I wanna bring up is we travel with our three dogs. We have a Golden Retriever, a Great Dane German Shepherd mix, and a, uh, remind me of Appa's breed? St. Bernard. St. Bernard, thank you. I don't know why that skipped my head. I was gonna say Bernese Mountain Dog. St. Bernard, he's new to the family. But we brought all three of them with us uh, this weekend for a two-day camping trip up in the Colorado Rockies, above 11,000 feet of elevation, and everyone was great. We fit perfectly. So one of the reasons I love the Revel is this entire back situation over here. So come on back with me and take a look. So first off, you get this giant sort of garage space that I could put a motorcycle in, a bicycle, uh, whatever I want, of course. However, then if you just back up a little bit, I can hit this switch right here and I can pull this bed down from the ceiling and we have all the sheets and everything off in the washing machine at the moment, but I can pull this bed all the way down into its resting position. Here we go. And if you take a look in here, let me just kick the lights on. There we go. I'll go past you. You can see you have almost, I would say a full size bed, maybe not quite a queen, but uh, definitely lays flat when you just push the mattress down a little bit. And to me, that's just fantastic. Underneath the bed, there's still probably three feet where the dogs can hang out. That's where they usually sleep at night. The humans are on the bed. Um, another thing I really like about this van is if you come back up front again, I'll show you inside the restroom situation. In here, let's just make sure there's a little top notch that I sometimes forget about. And this door is really kind of hard to open if I'm honest. It has like a crazy strong magnet there on the bottom. It almost feels like you're gonna break it. But we've used it, we're using it as trash for now, but there's a full stand-up shower and the toilets here. So you can use the toilet, you know, just standing this way. If you're a guy or if you're a girl, you can sit this way or you can rotate it around. So there's plenty of options. And I've been able to shower in here when we've been like entertaining people out on the campground so they don't see me with the door closed and I fit in there, I'm six foot one and I can take a nice hot shower all on my own. I think this is one of the coolest things. It's something a lot of the other vans don't offer because it honestly does take a lot of interior space away having this 
sort of restroom and shower situation. You know, it's a big part of the van, but to me, it's something I wouldn't want to live without, and I really enjoy it. Then we have the seating area where we've kind of put the window shades on right now. Something that's nice, it is kind of tight. I really hate the material that these cushions are made out of. I don't know what they're using, but they just feel so uh, nasty. I don't know, I just don't like touching them. So uh, you can get different color schemes. I don't know if there's a way around that, but I'm just not, not a fan of that material myself. That's my personal preference. And we'll get into all of the electronics in a later portion. This table, listen to this squeak. This just shows kind of that build quality I was talking about. It doesn't seem to be all that amazing. Listen. That's no pressure, by the way. That's just like annoying. And then every time you hit a bump, you just hear this kind of. So I, what I think we're going to end up doing is just pulling that table out, finding a different solution to mount another type of table there. And uh, one of the best parts about this RV though, are all of the power ports and plugs everywhere. So you can see we have USBs here. We have power outlets right up here. We have outlets in here, which we have some other stuff going on. I'll tell you all about this later on. It's some modification stuff. We have power outlets in the back. We have a 20 amp power outlet here that's used exclusively. Well, you can plug whatever you want in there, but you can only use that to power your induction cooktop on high power because this is, again, a NEMA 520 uh, outlet. The rest are NEMA 515s. There's underfloor storage. Honestly, plenty of storage throughout this van. I think people order these things and then get this garage lounge storage system. Not to say it's a bad idea. I just think it's very expensive without kind of living with the existing van and seeing if it fits. And my impression, at least at this point, is I'm so happy we didn't order any extra storage solutions that took away from the garage space because, honestly, there's almost more storage than we know what to do with. And we do travel pretty light, but it's been very impressive so far. Nice cabinets and things. The uh, pantry here, for example, is extremely deep and tall. I think you can buy more shelving throughout if you come in and take a look at this. Uh, the shelves are pretty spaced far apart, but you, there's a company that sells some extra ones. We have some marshmallows up here and chips and salsa and stuff. It's been been really fantastic. So that's your quick tour of the van. Uh, we'll get into some of the intricacies now as to some of the things we've learned <laughs> as first time RV or van lifers. Now, some of you might be wondering, well, why didn't you guys go out and build a van? You know, we, we're known in sort of the car reviewing world as being very electric vehicle focused. And I do like EVs. I also love combustion cars. Um, but they're like, why, why didn't you go out and build one? You spent all this money on a Revel. Like, why, why would you do that? And there's a couple reasons. The first is if I went out and built a van or, or you know, built, bought a chassis and hired someone to build it out, it would be, look at Kyle's wacky creation. Imagine trying to sell that in three years with zero technical manuals or you know reliability concerns and fixing it on the road, no service network there. So that to me was just like a non-starter for our first foray into RVing. At some point in the future, are we gonna build a van? Maybe, I think it'd be really fun, but we need to learn about it. We need to use something. Well, I want sort of the standard before we go out and do it on our own. And not to say that we will, if, if they keep making cool ones like this, we probably won't ever have to. But come over here, this is the seal that shows that this is truly an RV from Winnebago. And it's the you know RV association sort of stamp of approval that this is a motor home and that helps with resale. Also, if anyone wants to finance this vehicle in the future, they can then go out and get RV financing instead of vehicle financing, which should allow them to extend their term farther out into the future, maybe 20 years even. You know, not, not to suggest any of your financial decisions, but at least it's possible to insure this, register it, and run it as an RV instead of a van that's then been converted. So. From a resale perspective, no brainer, this was the way to go, even if we spent a bit more money up front. It also took a lot less time than building our own. But we're learning many things even with this vehicle and there's a lot of intricacies that go along to this. And even things from like the refrigerator, for example, we had to make sure that this was a compressor driven refrigerator and that means it can operate at angles of tilt. We've parked this thing a couple nights where we're like way tilted over because we don't have leveling blocks for it yet. And the refrigerator still works and stays cold. 
It also runs off the chassis 12 volt battery, I believe. Therefore, I've never had to turn this fridge off. It stays cold all the time and the solar panels on the roof keep it topped up and running. These are the things I just didn't even think about. And then you get to your whole water system. Come around to the back because you know, a lot of people who buy RVs hang out at campgrounds and they're all smushed in next to each other and really nothing against campgrounds. It's just not where I want to be spending a ton of time if I'm honest. So coming around back here, we have our whole water system, which is pretty interesting. First off, we have hot and cold water. Well, how do you get hot water in an RV? Two different ways. You have an electrical heater and you have a diesel heater. Well, I haven't tried the electrical heater yet because for the most part, we don't have the van plugged in. I think you can do it off the batteries, but I'm always trying to preserve battery life. So we fire up our hydronic heater. It's not a hydronic heater, it's an S-bar system. It's basically a jet turbine that runs off diesel that creates waste heat, which then heats up your water system, The uh, which is super neat. So you have on-demand hot water and it can just run that straight through. You can then choose, you know, that takes like 15 minutes to warm up by the way. So before you want hot water, you need to plan ahead to turn on the diesel, to turn on the hot water, and then eventually it will warm up. So these are the things we're learning. And then you gotta think about what you wanna do with your tank. Do you wanna leave a hose connected here all the time uh, and just run off of pressurized city water? Well, the nice thing is you don't have to use your onboard water pump. You don't have to worry about using too much water because you have an unlimited source from the city and you gotta change all these things around to what you wanna do. Then on top of that, if you wanna store water in here, you need to fill up your tank. What I've been doing is just filling it up till it overflows and then shutting it off because following the gauge on there, it seems to show full way before it's actually full. Uh, and you know, this is just an interesting thing for us to learn. And then you have to winterize it. We'll do a whole video on that because I'm not even sure how that works yet. There's tons of different methods going on there. And then you get to your electrical side of things. So the van itself comes with a TT30 adapter, this right here. This is what plugs in the wall. Well, a lot of homes, friends' houses don't have a 30 amp plug at home. So how are you supposed to plug the van into a wall? Well, you use this, which I typically wouldn't recommend. It's a 30 amp, 125 volt connection to a NEMA 515 regular wall plug. The problem with this is this is rated for 30 amp peak load. This is rated for 15 amp peak load. The van doesn't know what it's plugged into without changing some settings. So you can pop your breakers if you run the AC and try and charging charge the batteries. And these are all the things that you gotta get into with intricacies. And we'll talk more about the electrical system here in a little bit, but there are ways around them, but we had to figure a lot of this out. The other thing, just mentioning the water system really quick is from what my understanding is the water can get pretty dirty sitting in the tank in an RV, especially on a hot day. So we run all of our water through this water filter that goes into the RV. And then we plan to have a sink water filter as well. But I think all the water that we drink will be in water bottles itself. I don't think we'll ever drink the water that's out of the storage inside the RV. So that's the water fill up part. Now let's talk about the water dumping part. So when you have water that goes into the sink, you have to then push it to a gray tank with a little switch that sends it you, know, you fill up the sink, it doesn't drain. You hit the little button, it sucks it down with a pump into your gray tank, which then comes out here. And so your gray tank has a little bit less storage capacity than your freshwater tank. Makes sense, you're gonna be using some of that water. So what you do is you open this little tap and then pull this lever right out. I won't do it now because all of our gray water will flush out. And you, for the most part, if it's just like sink water, you can just dump it into a city drain because it's no dirtier than any water that you'd be using in your house. But if you happen to like put a lot of soap in there or other stuff, there's specific dumping stations that you can dump that into. And the van comes with a little slinky to make that dumping process easier. If you take a look under here, I can pop open this little container and you can see that blue tube. That's how you can direct that gray water right into the right spot. The black water, because it's a cassette type situation, uh, basically, how do I close this? There we go, there we go, locked in. The black water for your human waste just dumps into a toilet or an outhouse or a dumping station manually outside of this cassette. So, other intricacies. You can't drive around with things on the countertops. That goes without saying, but it's something you have to get used to. You hit the brakes and stuff starts flying everywhere and crashes. You also wanna make sure you choose an RV with mechanical latches. My friend Matt Farah recently took a 
uh, Sprinter on a vacation that was not a Winnebago and his had uh, magnetic latches all over the cabinets and stuff was flying everywhere and ketchup explosions and olive oil explosions. Here we have mechanical latches inside our RV. That's a quick, uh, you know, just intricacies, things you learn over time. Let me talk you through the entire electrical system. Let's walk you through the electrical system on the van. So you have to have 12 volt power for your chassis, for your infotainment, for your 12 volt power sockets. And you also have to have 120 volt for your power sockets for like your consumer goods and also for the lighting and things like this. And um, what comes with the Revel are two Xantrax 125 amp hour battery packs. And these are lithium ion, of course, and they sort of come like this, although not totally sealed up on all the plugs. Uh, they're really good batteries, comes with an app to control everything. And I'm pretty pleased so far with the entire system. Let me walk you through how this works. Everything pretty much gets run through these two battery packs. So to charge them, you can either plug them in the wall. Remember I mentioned that power circuit. You can run the diesel engine. It's got a separate alternator to charge these up. That's the fastest way to charge these is by driving along with the revs up a little bit, just juices these things up at about two and a half kilowatts combined. I think is the peak I've seen charging with both batteries combined. And then you can also charge them with solar. Now there's a couple different forms of solar you can do. With the van, I believe we have 225 or 215 watts worth of solar power on the roof. That's peak and they're flat, so they're not really facing in any direction. So like midday, you can get, I don't know, maybe 14 amps or so combined is the highest I think I've seen. Um, so that that's maxing out your, uh, your, your solar load, but then you can expand the roof load you can add more panels or even back here there's an extra little plug you can do which makes sense because uh, what what I think would be the smartest thing to do is park the van in as much shade as possible so you don't have to run the air conditioning and then put a solar suitcase out somewhere where there is sun and then run the power into these things so that seems to be making the most sense if you're hanging out at a campsite for a long period of time what we've been doing so far though is just running off the batteries at night, starting the van up in the morning and going for a drive into town to get Starbucks or whatever, and then going back to the campsite. And by the time we do that, they're fully charged. Because they're lithium ion, when it gets below freezing, they don't like to charge or really discharge. So you have a separate battery heater that you can kick on to warm these up to sort of a comfortable temperature where they can operate in their normal, their normal way. This Xantrex inverter over here is what powers all of your electricity, and it also handles the charging of the batteries from the wall. Uh, if you are plugged in through your 30 amp connection from the outside, it will bypass the battery packs to your wall outlets and just feed the electrical system straight grid power from uh, whatever you're plugged into. It just goes through a bypass mode, but also charges up these batteries off the wall. That can be a lot of load, especially when you're plugged in just to a little 15 amp connection here, and you can turn down through setting 24 on your inverter, how much uh, load you actually want to pull through the wall to charge the batteries, which seems to work pretty well. The inverter itself is rated at 2000 watts, and it's a pure sine wave inverter, which is great for your electronics because you get that really nice uh, sine wave that they want to see for electric uh, power, but it's only 2000 watts. So the air conditioner on like the hottest day, we've seen 106 degrees so far with this van pulled about 1700 watts, which was even too much for this wall outlet. We literally could not run the van with nothing else on plugged into the wall with these set at the lowest limit to run the air conditioning. When night came around, it started pulling around 1200 watts, which was at least maxing this out, but enough for it to handle so we could keep it cool throughout the night when we slept in there. And hot weather seems to really affect uh, your electrical, of course, it doesn't anything, no, nothing new here, but you can't run the AC and cook with that uh, cooktop I showed you earlier at the same time, just not possible. You gotta turn AC off, cook, and then you're back. And I, and I think that's a fair compromise. That's, that's totally normal, no issue whatsoever. Uh, that's pretty much the electrical system back here. I'm gonna show you the control panel up front that controls everything. It is worth mentioning about uh, how long you can run the AC for on the batteries. I think we've gotten about two and a half hours of real world usage before the batteries were down to about 20%. I don't want to take them all the way down to zero. Not good for lithium, of course. Uh, and, and honestly, the thing I don't like about the system is it full charges the batteries and just leaves them full all the time. I wish there was a setting I can just keep them around, you know, 50 to 80% or put a max charge up there at 80% so I don't have those things just sitting at 100% charge. But 
they're probably not as expensive as like an electric car battery, so maybe I shouldn't worry about it as much. Now we get to our whole control panel. Everything you're seeing here is factory fresh, straight from Winnebago. You have all of your lighting controls, which have a on, off, and dim setting. The dim isn't that dim, but really nice at night. But glad they have that. This is our whole diesel heating system. So right now what we have is our diesel or electric heating. So that's where you choose the electricity. And then you can choose, do you want it to go to the water or do you want it to heat up the cabin just by pulling this up or down? And obviously it's hot outside. We don't need it right now, but that's how you would set your heating temperature. And there's vents all throughout for the heat. The air conditioning and heat are two separate systems. This here is to control the Euro loft bed comes with a key, not sure why, we've just left it on, never changed it. So I would say that's kind of silly, to be honest. Why do you need a key? Maybe for kids, not sure. Then you have your uh, water uh, system. This is to turn your water pump on and off. You have your tank levels. You can see we have one third fresh water, one third gray waste tank right now. And then you can see the voltages of your chassis battery and your house battery back here. We have our Xantrex inverter board here. It's actually overheated, which does happen, and it's totally shut the system off. So what I need to do is go back here, turn the inverter off and back on again, and it's not even working. Welcome to RV ownership. Maybe we'll try and do it a hard reset later. Sometimes you have to turn all the systems off. So let's just do that now. I'll show you how this works. This has happened a couple times where our Xantrex has completely failed and we need to go through a reboot process. So I'm gonna turn the solar off. I'm gonna turn the batteries off. Let's see, battery off. Maybe I have to hold it in. Give it a second, there we go. Batteries off, everything is now completely shut off. Now what I'm gonna do is turn the batteries back on. I'm gonna turn the solar back on and you can see our Xantrix inverter has come back on. This happens, I've noticed when it gets really hot and the left side of the van, the van gets a ton of sunlight, goes into like some overheat protection mode, and you gotta restart everything. So if you've experienced this, let us know. These are the weird things we're learning, these intricacies, like I'm telling you. Then we have our solar charge inverter. I really don't think we get that much solar from the factory. I'd like to expand this at the future, but it's sort of cost prohibitive, especially when you can start this thing up, take it for a short drive and charge it in an hour. Yeah, I don't know, maybe it's not a good place to spend the money. If someone wants to give us solar panels, we'll use them. Uh, but this is how you check your voltages or your amps coming from the panels. Right now it's cloudy, only 1.3 amps at about 14 volts, not much power at all. We have our fuse panel down here, and this is how we can flip all the breakers on and off, which is really nice. So we have all of the, everything there in one easy spot. And I think that's your full tour of the electrical system, even with a real-time problem solving right on the spot. And now it's time for the issues and problems that we have had already throughout our ownership. Now, like I mentioned, we picked this van up with 56 miles on it in Iowa. We're back home in Colorado right now. We've had it for honestly a little bit over two weeks and we're about 2,200 miles. The biggest egregious problem and issue with this van that I have is come take a look inside all of this stick on carbon fiber nonsense that Winnebago thought was a good idea to put on there. For those of you who don't know, I am not really a carbon fiber guy unless it's useful. If you make a car out of carbon fiber, like a carbon tub or carbon body, it's to save weight, not for styling. Don't put extra stick on $5 stuff in a $200,000 van that just doesn't fit that well. And I'm worried if I take it off, it's gonna peel the piano black off behind there. Perhaps we'll come up with a wrap skin to go over it because that is just totally against the Kyle Connor way of thinking right there. Uh, a couple other weird oddities and issues that we've noticed so far are, you know, these things rusting here on the sides. I think I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the, the running boards are rusting. And this door, especially when you're parked on an angle, is not the power door. Earlier Revels, I believe the 2020 model year specifically, had the power door on it. And my understanding is Mercedes actually stopped making the power door an option for the 4x4 chassis. And why they did this, I don't know. I guess they had an issue with like inclines or off camber parking, but this is a really heavy door uh, and it goes so far back. You can see when you're inside, for example, 
and you have this shade down, which we generally keep down because we're out camping and it's bug season, and we have this shade down too. You have to like go over and reach all the way back and pull the door up. And if you're not tall, that's gonna be kind of annoying. Now, there are a couple Revel forums and owners groups on Facebook, for example, and someone has made like a halfway stopper kit. We're gonna be trying out to see if we can make our own copycat version of theirs, or if someone makes one on the market, comment down below and we'll get that for sure. So that is an annoyance. Let's see, what else we have? We have an actual couple problems inside. And this is to be expected. When we bought an RV, we did not expect a hassle-free ownership experience. So if you guys go over there, I can show you everything. Problems. First off, we were out camping the other night and our screw came out of the refrigerator, the Nova Cool. So it's actually kind of difficult to get it to unlatch and open up and to stay latched. So we use this secondary one. Good thing that's there, but that's still a little janky. It keeps coming out and doesn't really hold the fridge. We have USB ports here that only one of them works, which is kind of annoying. We have this table that just sounds like nails on a chalkboard, if not worse, which I think is a major problem. We have a whole power outlet in the back on the bottom that just was never hooked up from the factory. Always check your power outlets. We were told the same thing. I'm like, ah, factory pickup. They said they spent 30 hours going through our van. Well, guess what? They didn't go through it enough, I don't think. Aside from that, Alyssa, can you think of any other issues? Oh, we have one more thing in here. If you guys come take a look. So come on in here. Excuse the trash. Uh, this was a part that we actually broke or it was very easy to break, but this little latch came off. So we've been using this duct tape to hold the door closed. Um, that's kind of silly, I think. So other than that, I think the van's been pretty solid. Again, it's new, only 2000 miles. I'm not expecting an ownership free, hassle free experience. I'm expecting issues. You saw that Xantrex inverter freak out earlier. You know, this is just what it's like owning an RV. It's going to be interesting, but, uh, I think that goes with the course. I'd like to go over some of the upgrades we have already done and some of the upgrades we at least plan to do at this time in the future. And that you can go as crazy with a van build out as you want. Honestly, we might end up going that route. We may end up keeping it relatively stock, but there was one upgrade that we knew we had to do right off the bat. And that was tinting this windshield and the side windows. We ended up going with Expel ceramic tint. I believe we did a 80% tint on the windshield and we did a 35% or 30% on the side windows. Not dark, but really good for heat rejection and it kept things nice and cool. Of course, we needed to get that rock chip repaired right after we got the vehicle. Again, I mentioned Safe Light came out. It's not totally 100% perfect. You can still see a little chip there, but way better than what I thought we were gonna have to do, which would be replacing the entire windshield when we first got the van. And let's go through some more. Wheels and tires. I think we're gonna leave these as is for now, but I think if we were to totally build out the van, we'd go a little bit larger. The problem with going with too big of a tire on the Sprinter chassis is it freaks out the adaptive cruise control system, and that I don't want to have break because we've even picked this up and it already started faulting out on the way home from the uh, from the dealership, but I've, or from the factory, I should say, but I've heard Mercedes adaptive cruise control systems on these just sometimes wig out if a sensor gets blocked or something like this. So we cleaned everything, it came right back to normal, no worries there. But if you go with too big of a tire, you lose adaptive cruise. And because this is gonna really be our highway cruiser and off-road blaster, it's our do everything vehicle, uh, well, we can't lose that, I don't think. That's a minimum at, at a, as a necessary feature to have in a vehicle. The next would be a suspension upgrade, either going with more of a lift uh, or with a totally different suspension setup. I believe there's three main ones on the market for a Sprinter. I could see us definitely upgrading that into the future. I'm not a huge fan of how this van rides. Of course, it's a 10,000 pound beast, but it's extremely bouncy. And uh, I'll show you that when we drive it in, inside. It's not scary. I've had it up to 92 miles an hour, um, but uh, yeah, definitely could use some work in the suspension department at some point in the future if we decide to go crazy. If not, the stock is gonna be fine for 99% of people, and so far I've been very pleased with it up to this point. Coming down the sides, we may end up changing out our running boards for something a little bit sleeker, something that doesn't come all the way this far back. Honestly, the entrance to the van ends, again, right here, so the fact that we need any extra running board other than that, we really don't. We're gonna be definitely changing out this exhaust for something else. That's gonna happen very soon. Uh, early on, we're gonna be peeling the 
stickers off, like I mentioned. I'm gonna be changing this ladder out for one of the side mounted ladders. Uh, others have mentioned, you know, we should go for a back door mounted ladder. I get there's benefits to that over the side ladder. The side ladder could cut visibility, add wind noise. I just think it looks so cool. So we're gonna do that, but plenty of different options to do back here from boxes to racks to have a generator on the back so we can keep the van plugged in running off the generator. Uh, for example, if we're going to be parked in like Moab for a long period of time in the summer and we want the AC to stay on. Uh, we've already done a couple upgrades actually. If you take a look at that antenna up there, this is the Wii Boost Antenna Booster. Cannot recommend it enough. Actually, the first night we went up into the mountains to test it out right off the Switzerland Trail outside of Boulder, Colorado. We had one bar of service going in between zero and one bar, kicked this sucker on, then we had two bars of 5G and I was like, dang, this is awesome. So it worked really well. It's not magical though. You can't go in like the middle of nowhere with no service and expect it to boost zero. Anything times zero is still zero, but this certainly helped quite a bit. I wired it up myself. I have zero mechanical or technical ability for anything like that, and it worked just fine. We also have another uh, uh, addition to this vehicle. It's called a Waggle. It's inside, plugged in right up here under the roof. And this is a little brick that plugs into the USB port that monitors the temperature. I can go onto my phone, I can take a look at the temperature inside the van at any given time, and that way if we leave the dogs in there, they, they you know, at least we know they're safe and cool, and that's good. And actually one time it gave us an alert that it was like 87 degrees inside, right when we had left and kicked the AC on. We said, oh, and then the next alert we got said it was 84. It was dropping and dropping, and that worked well. Another thing we're going to do for the dogs, actually, is going to come up with a gate solution. So the, this is sort of the dog's area down here. There's two things we want to do. We're going to have a fan mounted somewhere so they can get airflow. And we're also going to put a gate across this door. It has to be narrow because the bed still has to slide up and down. Uh, so that the dogs can stay back here. If we're cooking or if we're driving, it's honestly safer if they're in the back of the vehicle. And... Um, you know, there's just situations where we just, you know, someone comes up to the van, we don't want them all running out. We just need to have a containment area for them. And that's gonna be this whole area back here, of course. In terms of other upgrades, well, let's pop the hood for that. Under here, this is gonna be an area of focus. This van is slow. There's just no way around it. So we have the, I think, OM something or other. It's the six cylinder turbocharged Mercedes diesel engine. They've been using them forever. Here is the lowest power tune of any variant. So we know that at least from the factory, they came with more powerful, powerful versions with the same engine. 188 horsepower, 340 pound-feet of torque, 330 pound-feet of torque. Man, is it just not enough to move this thing. We'll talk about it when we drive it. There's a couple different tunes available. One is the Rentec tune that you can buy from Owl Vans or straight from Rentec. I know the guys over there. Uh, and then also you can get a custom tune. My friend Lenny used to be the head tuner at Rentec. Awesome guy, trust him with all of my engine tuning that I've had on BMW and Mini products. He does Mercedes as well, obviously coming from a uh, Rentec background. I might just have him dyno tune this and do it real properly for this, this specific engine. We'll see how that goes, but that'll be a whole video at some point in the future, testing zero to 60 times, towing, exhaust temperatures. Are we gonna blow the thing up? I don't know, but we need to do something. It's dangerously slow. One of the things I like about the cab and one of the reasons we ended up going with the Rebel was the Mercedes layout. You know, I review cars for a living right here on this channel and having this MBUX control system, this awesome steering wheel, this really good gauge cluster. Well, this is just what I like for sure. So let's start this thing up. Let the glow plugs run for a second. On a cold start for the van, there's two different cycles that it'll go through. If it's cold, I've noticed below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, it will run in high idle for about two minutes and then come down to regular idle. If it's warm out 70, 80, 90, 100 degrees like it is today, uh, then it just starts right up at idle like most diesels do into drive. Interestingly, this, this handbrake is pretty neat. So you can pull it up, lock it in place, push it back down. That allows the seat to swivel. And then you just pull it back up and then put it down like a normal handbrake. So I find that to be kind of nice. We're in drive, seven speed uh, Mercedes transmission here. Uh, know it and love it, driven it, many products of course, but unlike most Mercedes is the steering's actually quite heavy. I kind of expected a one finger kind of vehicle and you can steer this with one finger, um, but it will, uh, it's kind of heavy, I gotta say. So there's also a power steering hose clamp 
that is faulty from the factory that there's a recall for. I haven't checked to see if ours is done yet, but it's early on the list to do. I'll peek in there in a little bit just to see if they have the proper clamp. So when you first start this engine up, it's honestly been pretty annoying out in, in the, uh, the, the camping spots that we've been going to. So you start this thing up, give it, you know, 30 seconds, a minute to warm up, and then you start driving and it gives you like no power. We've gotten stuck in four wheel drive in low range, just sitting at full power, trying to get this thing to move. Won't even boost up the turbo or anything like that. And then, you know, after a couple seconds of it doing that, then it finally just goes back to normal and gives you full beans. And, you know, that's just an intricacy uh, that you kind of got to get used to is this thing requires a lot of warm up. But if you let it idle for too long, it will fill up the diesel particulate filter, which then could cause harm. So you need to really drive this on the highway. There's a setting inside the menu here that will let you monitor how full your filter is. And if it gets close to 100%, you just got to get on the highway and drive this thing for about a half hour for it to do its regen cycle to burn off all the soot inside the exhaust. Uh, in terms of uh, diesel exhaust fluid, DEF, we've used exactly a half a tank of DEF in our 2,141 miles. So I imagine every 4,000 miles you need to fill it up. I hear exactly, uh, it's a five gallon tank and they are sold in two and a half gallon jugs. So at a half tank, we're gonna fill ours up. That should take a full two and a half gallon jug that you buy at the store, then you don't have any waste or leftover. And then, you know, you're, you, if you start running it out, the van won't let you restart, it limits your top speed. It gets pretty messy down there for all that emission stuff. Uh, in terms of daily driving, it's super easy to drive. It's got plenty of torque to pull you around town. I find that the van revs out a little bit too far, especially in first gear, but you can pull the upshift paddle and it will always try to go to the next available gear and drop the revs down. So I kind of just drive this thing around pulling the upshift paddle so it's not revving out to 3,000, 3,200 RPM in first gear, which is unnecessary if I'm not needing the power. It does this to help eliminate lag in daily driving situations, but uh, I would say it's not totally necessary. Here, for example, I'm full power and then it just boosted up. So you can hear stuff flying around. Off the line, this van is a dog. You really have to wait for the turbos to kick on uh, for this thing to move. And this is sort of that problem we were seeing off road. And it's something to be mindful of. It's just, you cannot pull out into an intersection and go. And this is a sprinter specific issue. So what we're gonna be doing is tuning it, opening up the exhaust, potentially trying an intake, just letting air flow better and seeing if this helps with the drivability at low speed. Cruising along the highway, 70 miles an hour in adaptive cruise, you could go all day long, no problem. This thing eats the miles. Uh, the wind does affect it quite a bit, but on a non-windy day, we've driven this thing 80, 85 miles an hour, even 90 miles an hour if you're foot down and rock and rolls real well. Going up the I-70 mountain pass, uh, which is, you know, real steep up to about 11,000 feet of elevation up at the Eisenhower Tunnel, maybe 10.5. Uh, we were wide open throttle most of the way, averaging about 68 to 70 miles an hour. And again, that's working the engine pretty hard. During our first thousand miles, one of the reasons I wanted to pick it up at the factory was to give this a proper break-in period. So we gave it, you know, gentle throttle, but then also a little bit of boost and vacuum, varied the revs, didn't sit on the highway, gave it a nice gentle break-in period, and then slowly started driving it harder over the next 500 miles. As soon as we hit 1500 miles, I kind of just beat the heck out of this thing, driving it up the mountains at wide open throttle to seed everything in, see if there were going to be any issues. And the only thing I've noticed is when you drive it pretty hard, the temperature gauge will start creeping up into the red uh, or just right outside the red. So the oil temps get pretty hot. I'm going to look into potentially an oil cooler situation just to prolong the life of the oil. Mercedes recommends 20,000 mile service intervals. You can certainly do that on your van. I'm not gonna do it on mine. I'll probably change the oil right at about 2,500 miles outside of us, kind of getting this thing broken in and everything good. And then we'll do every you know eight to 10,000 miles in between those intervals, 20,000 miles on oil. Just as hard as we drive this thing, I don't think it's gonna be best for long term. While I will drive it hard, I want it to maintain and I want it to last and I'll never drive it hard with a cold engine, things like this. So we're gonna do our best to take care of it. Other than that, squeaks and rattles when we picked up the van from the factory, they fixed one rattle, which was on the 
sliding door window, but it's been pretty quiet other than that one door in the bathroom I showed you that doesn't seal properly. Now that we have duct tape there, it seals just fine. And the one last thing I'd like to demonstrate to you is sort of this turbo lag off the line situation. You can see our temps are coming up out of the cold and we're warmed up enough for us to go hard acceleration. I just want to show you what to expect when you start driving this thing. Let's just take it off a of full cold AC just to give it a little bit of help. When you pull out into an intersection, so watch this. I'm just going to hit full throttle. You'll hear my foot hit the floor. Floored. Nothing, nothing, nothing. There we go, big power. So you need to be really ready for that many second delay off the line. Now what you can do is try and brake boost it, but it's pretty hard to time your entrance. And I don't like to sit on the torque converter for too long trying to build up boost with my left foot on the brake and right foot on the throttle. It just, it sometimes doesn't even work either because you need to be again, 1800 revs or so for this turbo to really build boost. And that I'd say is a pretty big drivability issue around town. It's, I mean, Alyssa, what do you think? Pretty annoying, right? Very annoying. Very annoying around town, especially when you're loaded up and you're just trying to do errands. You like have this surging problem and people will suggest pedal boxes and all these plug-in stuff. And while I haven't tried them, so I don't want to comment, Without an engine tune, you're not changing anything except telling the car how much throttle you're giving it. And if you're already giving it full power, it doesn't matter what you plug into the damn thing, you're getting, you're asking for full power. Here at speed though, you put your foot down and it goes and revs out to 4,000 and moves along just fine. So I would say I want the tune more for highway pulling and um, yeah, maybe around town we can fix some of this drivability stuff, but overall I'd say you know, for most people, if you're just patient with it, like here off the line, waiting, waiting, now we can go, you're gonna be totally fine with this thing. So, uh, final thoughts. Am I happy we went with the Revel? Am I pleased with the purchase? Well, 100%. I'm actually the most excited about this out of any vehicle I've ever owned. And I know I've pointed out a lot of problems in this video. You have to understand, my job is kind of to find faults in cars and to praise them where they're really good and to knock them where they're not. So I instantly go to all of the negative things that drive me nuts and I wanna fix. But overall, I just am so pleased with this van. I've been sleeping in it very comfortably. I think I'd like to add a mattress topper. That's an interesting thing we should put to our upgrades list. Definitely wanna upgrade this mattress or put a topper on there for sure. Uh, other things that I'd like to do with the van, well, you know, there's, there's countless things I, I'm sure I could think of, but am I happy with this purchase? 100%. I can't wait to tour the country with the dogs using this thing. It's the perfect thing for us at the perfect time. We're able to tow trailers, we're able to go off-roading, we're able to go camping out in the wilderness and kind of have everything in one spot. Plus it looks cool and it's a conversation piece and we're able to bring really neat content to you guys. And the one thing I wanna make very clear is I don't wanna make just Revel content in the RV world. I wanna review other vans, other RVs, and start figuring out this world because we do it with cars. Nothing's stopping us from breaking into the RV world and becoming the next Matt's RV Reviews or Andrew Steele and starting to review these things. So keep an eye on our channel for more. Let us know what you'd like to see. Hopefully this video is uh, helpful to you if you're interested in buying a Revel. And if you have any questions, of course, put them in the comments and the topic of our next video might just be answering your questions. See you on the next one. Bye-bye.